Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Impact Code podcast. This is episode 39 of the journey. We are absolutely thrilled to have you here, and we want to thank you for subscribing to the platform. We want to thank you for being part of the journey with us, for engaging, for listening, for discussing, and for watching the platform. Uh, we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Impact Co, and as well as to the podcast, if you search on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or whatever platform, platform you use on podcast to listen to us, you search Impact Co, you'll find us there. So we'd encourage you to listen and engage and listen what you think. So today on episode 39, I am thrilled um, to invite my guest today, who you will get to know very, very shortly, uh, but her name is Safara Abdul Karim. She is a public health lawyer, a people, people advocate, Group 621, and the Johannesburg Society of Advocates. And she is a rock star. If you haven't heard of her yet, which I'm sure you have already, you'll know that um, after this, you'll know that she's one of the brightest young minds that we have in South Africa. So for I'm so glad to have you here on the Impact Group Podcast. Welcome. How are you doing on this gloomy uh, Johannesburg morning? No, thank you so much for having me. I must say, being here is is brightening up my morning and, and chasing away the, the the misery of the clouds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to I had to to like you know really you know, get myself going today. When I went out for a run, it was so gloomy and dark. I was like, yeah, winter's really here. <laughs> so I, I totally get it. So, friend, thank you so much once again for you know joining us and, and for being a part of our journey episode 39 um, of the Impact of Podcast. I think to start off with, um, we always you know want to get to a little bit, get to know you a little bit better. So tell me a little bit about yourself um, in terms of where you were born and where you grew up. Uh, so I'm a Durbanite through and through, uh, and really uh, at every other stage of my life have just been wishing I was back in Durban. <laughs> Um, you know, there's no place better than 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 the tropical, um, temperate climate and humidity <laughs> of the coast. Um, so yeah, I grew up in Durban. I was born in Chatsworth, uh, as I think most Indian people my age in Durban were born around there. Mm. And um, I grew up, uh, you know, in in different areas in Durban. And um, yeah, and then I I I I did my university at uh, at the Cape Town, and then moved to Joburg subsequently. But I've always uh, loved living in Durban. Yeah. <laughs> no, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I was, I was in Durban a couple of weeks ago. I, I it does have a, a strange magnetic pull on an individual. So I totally get it. I totally get it. So, I mean, how would you say you make an impact in your world? So I think um, some people may or may not know this, but both my parents are epidemiologists, which is a fancy word for saying they study epidemics. <laughs> now, um, you know, three years ago, most people didn't know what an epidemic was. Uh, nowadays, most people know what an epidemic is. They're living through it. And um, some people may even know my parents who have been very involved in the COVID-19 response. And when I was growing up, all I saw was their commitment to public health. And there's something inherent when you work in public health because it has the word public in it. It's like so few other disciplines because it attracts people yeah. who are focused on bettering health other than their own. It's not like being part of a pharmaceutical company or being part of a corporate entity. These are people who are genuinely committed to improving the lives of people they may never meet. And that's the environment in which I grew up in. And although my parents are doctors, doctor and biochemists respectively, that is what they instilled in me, is that you should work and serve to better your community. And um, not only myself, but my siblings as well, I'm part of a family of five, have all chosen our cause. And it's quite funny because I decided to pursue law and my sister pursued journalism and my brother pursued computer science. And yet we've all found ourselves over the last three years gravitating into the space of COVID. Um, but even before that, my journey was much more focused on the impact in which um, laws can be used to improve people's health. And I think it's so incredibly powerful. And, th and that's really been my goal is how do I change lives? How do I improve them um, for the better? How do I, 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 you know, people who may not have, I may not ever meet 
Mm -hmm. How do I, I, I touch their lives and, and leave this community that I treasure so much better for me having been here? Yeah, I love that. I think that's that's incredible, um, you know, to, to serve your world to make it better. And, you know, we're going to find out a little bit more about how you do that um, in the in the coming minutes. But before we well, before we get there, before we maybe dive in a little bit too deep, um, anyone who follows you on, on social media um, knows that, that you love baking. So I found this out, you know, when I was kind of shamelessly stalking you, trying to see, you know, trying to find out a little bit more about not the, the public side, but, you know, the sort of what are the things that you like to do. And I saw, you know, the first baking post, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one, and the, I was like, I think there's a common thread here. So I said, okay, cool. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what, is your, what is your favorite thing to bake currently? <laughs> and what is one thing that you'd love to learn to bake as well? So I started baking not because I like baking, but because I love birthdays. And so the main thing I make is birthday cakes. <laughs> and that's the thing I'm proudest of. I mean, it's the most stressful thing because if it goes wrong, you sort of left with a situation where somebody's got a particularly ugly cake. <laughs> it's quite intense, right? Because it, it's it's a moment thing. Like, there's no repeats. <laughs> there's, you know, if, it, if it doesn't work now, you have 365 days to reflect on it. <laughs> like, it's quite intense. No, exactly. I remember once I was, because I started baking when I was about 15, 16, my mom thought I needed to be self-sufficient when I left for university. And so she said, and, and she saw an opening for some reason. I liked cake and I like sweet stuff. So she said, okay, you're going to learn how to bake. I remember the first birthday cake I ever made, as I was icing it, it started falling apart. I actually started crying. I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> but my mom salvaged it because she's a problem solver. Mm. But um, the thing that I tried, which I think half the plan it tried to do during COVID is everybody tried to make sourdough bread and I you know I made I, I made three different attempts and probably lost about three kilos of flour in the process of trying to make my own sourdough starter. <laughs> so it's one that's a work in progress and I have to tell you guys like you know when you start making a sourdough starter and it goes wrong it really starts, it, you know, the, the smell just permeates your entire house. Consequences are dire. The consequences are dire. <laughs> I'm getting it wrong. I get you. No, I totally get you. I, I think I, 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 I can make a mean red velvet and a mean cheesecake. Like, I can really do that. But the one thing which I haven't been able to master yet is, is like baking bread. Like any types of bread, like rolls or, you know, like any, like sourdough, you know, is a classic example. Love sourdough bread, but currently I just, I just buy it. <laughs> I'm the same. <laughs> yeah, I so I think, I think, I think we both need some lessons. So if anybody's listening, you know, <laughs> can offer us lessons. We would gladly, gladly take you up on the offer. Uh, no, thank you, Sophia. Thank you so much. And I think... Really, I really want to dive into it and talk about, you know, the role of, of, of law in, in providing equitable access to healthcare in, in Africa. Um, and I know that, you know, law and, and health and health are something, are two things, you know, two pools that, you know, you, you swim in um, concurrently at the same time. And I'm really keen to unpack that and, and to, to get into a little bit more of that. So I guess to start off with, um, you know, what, what, what impact does law um, have on health in your view? So, you know, for the past uh, four years, ever since I started working on sort of public health law, mm. I'd always have to spend the first five minutes of two minutes of every presentation I gave explaining why a lawyer has anything to do with public health. Mm. And for COVID, it was always a really complicated answer. And so I came up with this way in which I do it, which is I take a Coke can or a soda bottle, yeah. show it to people. And I'd say, do you see this, this bottle? the plastic it's made out of, the 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 sort of intellectual property and, and trademarking, the, the the what the name is, the mm -hmm. contents of what's inside, how it's priced and how it's sold. 
every single one of those aspects is governed by a law. And so if you want to change what people eat and drink, you change laws. Of course, I no longer need to say that because each of us South Africans has experienced the power of law and how it can shape health and change our lives yeah. over the past three years. I mean, we just had the end of the state of disaster. Prior yeah. to that, how we walked around, where we could walk around, when we could walk around, yeah. all of those things were governed by a law that we had to wear masks, you know, um, sanitizing, everything. Every single one of those public health interventions wasn't implemented by a doctor somewhere sitting in a hospital. It was imp implemented by a lawmaker with the stroke of a pen. Yeah. And that's really the encapsulation of why law has such a massive impact on people's health. Because people's health is far more than just whether or not they go see a doctor. And so when you're talking about systemic change, yeah. the way you begin to affect that is through a, you know, a, a signing your name on a piece of paper and turning it into a law. And that's really the power um, that I'm trying to harness when I talk about public health law. Love that, absolutely love that. And I, I think we all have experienced that, right? You know, when, when, we, when we all couldn't, you know, run outside for a bit, <laughs> um, or, or then we could run outside, but we had to have masks. <laughs> it was like, okay, then we could run outside without masks, <laughs> you know, but it was at a certain specific time of the day and other, I think you're quite right. I think really the last couple of years have, have transformed our view of that um, in particular. And I think it's something we probably underestimate and, and don't realize in that context. And so it's quite a powerful and profound thing that you've said. So in, in, in your view, what do we mean by, by equitable access? And I think some of our listeners who'd be listening to this, you know, might come from other disciplines and, you know, be hearing this phrase equitable access and being like, what, what on earth do you mean? And so what do we, what do you think we mean by that? And what are the, the barriers to it um, in Africans specifically? So I think a lot of my work around equity and access has really focused on um, COVID-19 vaccines, which are a biomedical intervention. But the reality is the poorest and most vulnerable in our society are also unfortunately the unhealthiest. They live in the most polluted areas, their homes are not well insulated, um, so they get sick often. Um, you know, they generally tend to be far away from healthcare services. And yeah. Equitable access is about changing systems, but often we think about the individual and we ignore the sort of more global things. So, for example, you know, I think about the beginning of 2021, which was a very difficult time for me personally, because there was a lot of pressure on the South African government to buy vaccines. Why haven't we bought vaccines? You know, and it's all the government's fault. Yeah. And the work that I had done preceding that, which I must say built on and stood on the shoulders of giants like Fatima Hassan, Mark Haywood, Treatment Action Campaign as a whole, et cetera, um, was really about recognizing that this is a global problem. Yeah. High income countries have monopolized access yeah. to certain things. What gets developed in the first instance is controlled by these pharmaceutical companies who are driven by profit, not by changing the world. There's a reason why the treatment for malaria hasn't changed in the last 30 years because people who are affected by malaria regularly are not the places where pharmaceutical companies think that there's money to buy malaria drugs. Yeah. But it is also why we have billions and billions going into things like cancer research and hypertension because those are diseases that affect very wealthy people and wealthy nations as a whole. And so when we talk about healthcare equity, we always, or health equity more broadly, we always talk about it in levels. You know, people like to focus on the individual, but it's actually something that's systemic. It emanates from colonialism and imperialism. Yeah. And it is something that is geographical, not just geographical in terms of what is my zip code versus somebody who lives in Soweto, but also what is my, where I live, my country of South Africa, relative to a place like, the US or even some of our neighbors. So, and I think 
when you look at COVID-19 vaccines, when you see these amazing heat maps, mm -hmm. you see that the colors on the top of the, uh, the top of the world map are very dark because those people have achieved insane things like 80% of their population having been covered by a vaccine. Yeah. And then you look at the bottom and so few African countries have have exceeded even 5% of their population vaccinated. That is real life inequity in access to vaccines. And that isn't just a, you know, COVID's thrown a spotlight on something that's been a problem since basically vaccines were invented. And, and, and that's the issue here is that that is not an accident. It is deliberate and intentional, and it is something that we then need to be deliberate and intentional about undoing. And I think, firstly, recognizing that, right? That that, that I think it's it's a recognition that probably we 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 made most last year in early 2021, as you, as you already point out, when there was a lot of questions and pressure around that time around, you know, why do we not have vaccines? But you know, for example, the UK does. You know, the UK is as a surplus of vaccines, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're struggling to find what to do with them, <laughs> but you know, we we can't even get any. So it, it it's really something which which I think you know came to light then. But as you rightly point out, it's not just COVID; it's also other diseases as well. And you have to see where it's. You have to actually look step step back, look at the bigger picture, and see that it is like that. And so, you know, it seems that. It seems to be the case that in many areas, um, so it, it seems to be the case in many areas that you know the existing laws are adequate, um, but are not enforced or, or used. Um, so, it, do you think this is the case with access to healthcare, um, or are, are there any changes to laws which are urgently required or, or needed in that space in particular? So, I'll just deal with my two main issues or my two main areas, which is. Yeah before I worked on COVID and actually even now <laughs> I work on obesity prevention some people call it prevention of diet related non-communicable diseases which is diseases that are driven by unhealthy diets so when people eat ultra processed food unhealthy foods and it's always seen as such an individual thing oh you made the choice to eat that chocolate mm. but what we found actually is that much of people's diets is driven by the environments they live in, in the same way that I described their health overall. Yeah. Um, and so they, you know, in that instance, laws are woefully inadequate. And this, this again, you know, when I talk about de it being deliberate and intentional, mm. these laws have deliberately been stalled, diluted, delayed by industry actors whose profits stand to be drastically impacted by these laws. So for example, we had something that the Department of Health chose to publish in 2014. Mm -hmm. It was going to be a label that was going to tell you as an individual who knows nothing about food and nothing about diet, whether or not something was good to eat. And the way it was going to do that was it was going to use a traffic light system. So it was going to say to you, red means be cautious about eating this or maybe don't eat it because mm -hmm. it's too much salt, too much fat, too much sugar. And green was going to be, well, this is actually maybe good for you to eat because it's not got all these unhealthy ingredients. Mm -hmm. In 2014, if you think about when that was, that was eight years ago. Yeah. If you go into a shopping, uh, if into a supermarket today, can you, without having to decide, and you're an engineer, so of course deciphering numbers is probably one of your areas of strength. But for a lawyer in particular, we're, we're bad at it. Yeah, yeah. Go into a grocery store. Firstly, you've got to take that packet off the shelf and look at the back mm. and figure out if it's good for you or not. So you could, by just putting that little label on the front of a packet, you could drastically change the kinds of choices people are making. You could make them aware of what they're eating and then enable them, empower them, like, like you talk about, educate, and then inspire them to change mm. behaviors. And that law hasn't been passed. Um, I was working with the Ministry of Health on an improved version of that that was based on, on the South American model. Yeah. And that too, that research was finalized in, in, in about two years ago. And, and we still haven't seen that change because partly because COVID has sucked up anybody's bandwidth to think yeah. about anything else. Mm -hmm. 
also because there's a lot of opposition to these types of, of interventions. So on one level, laws are not adequate. On the other, you're quite right. We do have some incredible laws in South Africa. We are one of the leading countries. We have limits on sodium, which a lot of people don't know, but hypertension is one of the most prolific diseases in South Africa. And we have one of the first laws ever passed mm. to reduce the amount of salt in things. Um, and and we also have limits on, you know, we've banned um, tra trans fats, for example, which are exceptionally harmful. We have a tax on sugary beverages. Mm. And what's so difficult as a public health practitioner is people either aren't aware of these laws or they actively feel like these laws are not good for them. You know, a lot of people were opposed to the sugar tax because they're government just wants more money it's harming the sugar industry yeah. and they didn't realize that this is about actually improving their health as an individual and it's because of the massive marketing campaigns people feel a sense of association with places like coca-cola or pepsi you know they want to buy and cook or you know popcorn and coke when they go to the movies and and so i think you know and it's just a big, big pharmaceutical companies are no different um so so you know that's really where the issue comes in is um, that a lot of these laws are, are outside of the control of governments. But if you can show as an individual or as a community that you want these things, despite what industry is saying, then that gives government the political impetus to begin to improve things. And that's really what we need. Yeah, I think that's incredibly wise and 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 profound I, I wasn't aware that you know that that robot system was a consideration but now that i think about it that's it, it's so it's so the messaging is so simple and so easy to understand that it, it can reach and impact millions of, of people um and, and and the cascading impact of that you know in terms of impact on households impact on communities impacts on future generations is, is incredible um, and you're quite right. I think we are in a fortunate position in South Africa in terms of the laws that we do have. Um, but I think, you know, there are spaces where we can improve, um, in particular in the examples that, that you have mentioned. I think it's it's incredibly wise and profound in terms of what you've shared. And, and thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so, so for a fine day, uh, how, how can the young, ambitious professional, um, for example, often on a company medical aid, and, and somewhat <laughs> insulated um, from the problems of access. Um, so really talking about people who are saying, well, I hear you, but this doesn't impact me. Um, you know, how can they play a part in this, um, in South Africa in, in, in particular? So I think the first thing is, and, and this is something that we, as a generation, we have incredible power, which is, is always the option to vote with your wallet. Yep. You don't have to support companies that engage in unethical practices. Yep. And and we've seen people, you know, for example, there was a boycott of Shell. Yes. In if people are aware of a problem, they can vote with their wallets first and foremost. So I think that's something that we, in particular, as young professionals, have an immense power over. And I think it's something we've seen. It's something very proud to own the label of millennial when it comes to this sort of thing, because it is something that our generation take so seriously we we don't support unethical companies in the way that you don't support an unethical um petrol company in the same way you shouldn't support an unethical pharmaceutical company an unethical food company etc the other thing is because i'm talking about laws what people have to remember is that lawmaking is not something that happens up here it is something that is required to involve public participation yeah and there are absolutely incredible organizations. One of the ones that I've worked with particularly closely is Amandla.mobi, who reach out to the most, everyone across the spectrum, including vulnerable groups of people, and get them to have their say on legislation and yeah. laws and petition for certain things to happen. Um, I, you know, and, and what I what I find so powerful about platforms like that is they're not just saying to you, hey, this law is coming up, do you want to say something? They're giving you information mm -hmm. about why the law is important and what you can say about it to reinforce it. Um, 
know, they said to, to, they were talking about the National Health Insurance Bill, for example, which is something that maybe as middle class individuals, we might feel a bit iffy about, but it is really important for people who are of lower socioeconomic classes. And they said, you know, the, the Department of Health received something like 30,000 comments on the National Health Insurance. 12,000 of those came from a mantla dot mobi. That means that instead of it being pharmaceutical companies and healthcare insurers and wealthy individuals who stand to lose profit from an NHI, oh, almost half the comments came from the people who would have benefited from it. And I, so I think it's really important. You have the resources, you have the ability to go and educate yourself and inform yourself about things. And there are so many tools out there that want you to participate in our lawmaking processes. And yeah. it, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be about health. You can think about, um, for example, the bill that was just passed around um, disclosure of private funding of political parties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So things that change how our society functions and okay. those small instances where we can have a say. So I think law, more than many other disciplines, invites your participation if only you'll take the hand and the invitation that's being extended. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I'd really encourage anybody who is listening to this who has no doubt been educated and inspired <laughs> by you, um, which is what we do here at Impact Co, uh, to, to, to participate, to read, to learn, to ask questions, to engage. And I think, um, you know, social media is a wonderful tool for that as well, um, for people to engage in that particular discourse. So for I want to thank you so much um, for coming on to the Impact Co podcast, for being a part of our journey. Um, it was incredible hosting you. Um, I look forward to us getting sourdough baking lessons. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I also look forward to welcoming you back on the show. This was incredible. Thank you so much. I hope that you have enjoyed it. No, thank you so much for having me. And really, this is a great platform. And I hope that many people, not just this episode, but other episodes get inspired to do um, incredible things. Because I think um, what I realized looking through the list of your videos is that you can really make an impact in any field, in any discipline, and basically at any age, which is really inspiring. Quite right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I could do with you on that. Um, to you, the listener, we want to thank you for listening in, for... Uh, watching or listening, uh, depending on where you are catching this. And um, if you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe and please do leave a review for us as well to let us know how the content uh, impacted you, educated you and inspired you as well. And from Sephora and myself, we want to say thank you so much and goodbye.